All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's BU Professional Development Webinar, How to Overcome Three Common Challenges New Managers Face. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm a member of the Alumni Career Programs team here in the Office of <coughs> Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by BU Alumni Relations and is offered to our 339,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, BU uh, uh, is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. And we aim to do this by providing our alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and resources. Uh, I know we have an alumni joining us today some, from some very far away places. We've got alumni signed up from Toronto, Beijing, Bogota, Colombia, Etamp, France, Athens, Pune, India, Tokyo, Riyadh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, Phoenix, Fort Collins, Colorado, Orlando, Atlanta, Honolulu, Normal, Illinois, Zachary, Louisiana, Hoboken, New Jersey, Cleveland, and as always, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Wakefield, Waltham, Watertown, Wellesley, Westfield, Westford, Westwood, Worcester, Rentham, and more. Uh, to all of you out there, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate your participation in this program. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, today's webinar is being hosted on our Zoom online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Zoom support directly. Uh, and you see the number on your screen in front of you, 1-888-799-9666. Today's webinar is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on our BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature. If you hover over your screen with your cursor, uh, you should see a menu pop up. One of those uh, is labeled Q&A. It's a box with a Q in it. Just click on that, and that'll allow you to type in your question. Uh, we are going to save plenty of time to get to those at the end of most presentation. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, BU Questrom School of Business alumnus Mo Shanmugam. Mo is an executive career coach and founder of MGC Coaching, where he enjoys working with ambitious professionals who want to create more fulfilling careers. Prior to coaching, Mo worked as an entertainment attorney for companies including Def Jam and Sony Music, and also held roles in marketing for Reebok and talent management at the United Talent Agency in Los Angeles. Mo believes greater self-awareness leads to better career decisions, and he works with his clients to build their self-awareness, confidence, and clarity so they can reach their career and leadership goals. I invite you to learn mo uh, more about Mo by visiting his website at www.mgccoaching.com. Mo, thanks so much for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and um, let's ask you to put your slide deck up, and then the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jeff. So I'm going to hit present here. Don't forget to hit uh, share screen in Zoom. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Awesome. Looks good. All yours. <clears throat> Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, Jeff, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so excited to be speaking with you all today. Uh, it's going to be a fun presentation about um, how to overcome three common challenges new managers face. <clears throat> so I thought I'd start off with uh, some anecdotes of the life of managers. And I pulled this quote from one of my favorite uh, leadership authors and speakers, Simon Sinek, uh, from his book, Leaders Eat Last. And uh, it goes like this. The true price of leadership is the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. Great leaders truly care about those they are privileged to lead and understand that the true cost of leadership privilege comes at the expense of self-interest. So that, that, that quote sort of stands out to me as, as the highest ideals of, of what leadership is, is you're, you're placing the needs of others above your own. Um, and then uh, uh, with my research into this presentation and having worked with other managers, uh, I want to share another anecdote uh, to start off this presentation. And in a recent survey, workers were asked what they wanted from their manager. The second most popular answer was that they wanted them to quit. So there you have sort of the full spectrum of what it means to be a manager. 
Um, but really what it comes down to is good managers know how to take care of their people. And if you're not doing that, well, that's, that's where you're missing the boat. And so that's what we're going to focus on on today's presentation. <clears throat> and here we go. So the agenda for today is I want to touch on um, these five topics. What gets in the way of being a good manager? The three common challenges uh, new managers face. Uh, how to build your confidence as a new manager. How to build trust with your team and how to manage underperforming team members. So that's what we'll cover today. And for those of you here on the presentation, uh, you know, this is ideally for new managers who wanna learn best practices, uh, but also for you experienced managers out there who just wanna improve their performance and, and sort of brush up on important topics. <clears throat> so I invite you to listen to this webinar um, in a specific way. So some webinars provide surface level how-to prescriptions. Um, and and this, this webinar, I, I hope to go a step further than just telling you what to do. But I wanna help you understand that as a coach, I wanna make you aware of the deeper root causes that affect your performance as a manager. So we're gonna discuss things like the fear of failure, um, the fear of other people's opinions and judgments about us, um, you know, the, uh, our fear of looking weak, uh, the bad sides of the downsides of perfectionism and our need to avoid criticism. These underlying root causes um, tend to be the uh, the problems that that we need to address in order to fix the symptoms of of bad management and the challenges of of managers face. Sorry, these slides get stuck here. So my goal for you at the end of this presentation is to give you the confidence and perspective you need to lessen your fears so that you can take action and no longer feel trapped by your circumstances. And, and how I like to do that is uh, really present to you um, a case study of a manager I worked with and who we'll call Tim. <clears throat> so Tim is a 33 year old account executive uh, he works at a large SaaS company here in Boston. He's well liked by colleagues and seen as a to be the team of 20 account executives and, and sales development reps. So this is when Tim came to me. He had gotten this promotion, uh, but he was finding the job challenging. It was his first time managing people. Um, he was struggling with being a boss to his friends. So, you know, he worked with these people, he was on the same team with them, and now here he was um, being elevated to their manager. <clears throat> he felt overwhelmed from having to do his job and manage the work of, of other people on the team and holding them accountable and making sure they were hitting their goals as well. Um, and he found that he was avoiding having difficult conversations with his team members. And in Tim's words, he described it like this. This job is like drinking through a fire hose. There's so much data and information I have to be aware of. I have to do my job and manage the work of 20 other people. It's, and it's not just about the work, but I'm having to deal with personality issues. It's like I'm dealing with children. So some of you might, might see yourself in Tim's story or, or see aspects of, of what, you're going, what you're experiencing in Tim's story. But you know, at the end of the day, Tim wants to be a great manager and I'm assuming those of you on this call want to be a great, great manager as well. <clears throat> so with Tim wanting to be a great manager, he, he never gave much thought to what that really meant. Um, <laughs> he was doing his best and I'm going to have to start to add loop here as we did having some technical difficulties with the slide here, but essentially, you know, Tim had this idea that he wanted to be a good manager. Um, but he didn't give, give that much thought. He was doing his best. And what, where Tim found himself was he was in his default management style. You know, he was out there doing his job. He was flying by the seat of his pants. He was working on urgent matters, the things he had to get done. 
Um, he was dealing with the personnel issues as they came up. Um, and he was, he found himself taking on responsibility that he should have delegated. And, and, and at the end of the day, there was no real planning to what he was doing. And so, you know, even though Tim wanted to be a great manager, you see that he had sort of his default management style. And, and, and I want you to sort of, um, look, look into your own experience about what your default management style is. You know, here we are, we're all doing our best work, uh, with the information we have. And sometimes um, when we're feeling stuck, when we're not performing to our best ability, um, I, I, that's, I like to identify that as our default style. And uh, you know, he was barely keeping his head above water. Um, and so let's focus on that first challenge number one here. <clears throat> and so one of, the, one of the main challenges I find when I work with managers is fundamentally that uh, they don't feel confident in this new role. And so this lack of confidence is a symptom of a deeper issue. Hey Mo, I just want to mention if you continue to have trouble clicking through the slides, I do have your deck open on my end. Uh, if, if it is really throwing you off and you want me to share your slides from my end, I can do that. Uh, but it seems like it's going okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Jeff. Yep. Um, so as, as Tim's coach, I needed to help him identify the deeper issues behind his lack of confidence and ultimately help him change the narrative he was telling himself. And as we discussed sort of what was getting in his way, he, we, helped, I, we identified that his underlying his lack of confidence was his fear of upsetting other people. It wasn't that he didn't know what to do or that he didn't want to do it. It's just that he was avoiding doing things that would be seen as unpopular. So you see, Tim had a need to be liked that was unconsciously sabotaging his effectiveness as a manager. So I, I want you all to sort of think about your own experience now as managers and think about what it is that's stopping you from doing what you know you need to do. And when I work with clients, I like them to identify something that it's usually something that they value that they need to stop doing. Uh, it's the thing that's getting in their way. So for example, it, you know, so here we are in Tim's case, um, through the co coaching, we identified that, you know, Tim had a need to be liked, which, you know, quite frankly, we all do. But that need to be liked was actually getting in, in the way of him being an effective manager. And so when I work with clients, I like to help them identify different versions of themselves. And so we named this version of Tim, Mr. Popular. You know, he wanted to be everyone's friend. He wanted to be the good manager. He didn't want to upset people. But unfortunately, that style of management wasn't working for Tim and it wasn't working for his team. And so while we, so what's, what's helpful about identifying uh, sort of a, a character or a version of yourself, it helps to remove you, uh, <clears throat> sort of, it helps to keep you one step removed from yourself. So, so it's not just about you, but it's just about there's a version of you that's operating right now that's not giving you the results you want. And so my job as a coach is to work with clients to help find their optimum, the optimum version of themselves. So when Tim and I worked together, um, I took him through one of, my, uh, one of my favorite exercises to do with clients is this exercise called interview your successful self. And in it, Tim created a new version of himself that gave him the confidence he needed to be an effective manager. Tim became Mr. Responsible. So this was the new version that Tim needed to be. He realized he had a responsibility to the company and to his team to step up and take this job more seriously. And, and when, he could, um, when, he, when he was being that character, when he was tapping into that version of himself of being Mr. Responsible, what he knew he needed to do came easily. He no longer felt uh, stopped by the need to feel liked because he knew it was more important to get the job done and to, and to be responsible to his company and the team. He realized he could be firm and fair, and that was in the best interest of everyone, including himself, uh, while trying to remain popular was just not working for him or his team members. So as I mentioned in this, in this webinar, I want you guys to go through the same experience. So here's exercise one that I'll share with you. So it's called interview your successful self. So I want you to sort of give some thought as, as I read the instructions on how to do this exercise. Imagine you get to interview the successful version of yourself a year from today. 
You are the definition of a great manager. You're confident, productive, effective, well-liked, and well-respected. Now, when you interview yourself, I want you to ask yourself three questions. What did you have to start doing to get here? What did you have to stop doing to get here? And what are three adjectives you would use to describe who you needed to be to get here? So remember, this is you interviewing your future self. And the thing I love about this exercise is one of the fundamental tenets of, of, of being a coach is that I treat my clients, I believe my clients have the best answers to their, to their own problems. The solutions that come from my clients are much more effective than me just telling my clients what to do. So when I, when I help, help clients tap into their more successful version, they come up with these amazing answers of what's, what, what they already know they need to do. And it becomes that much more easier for them to follow through on solutions that they came up with. So as you saw in Tim's example, he came up with the idea that he needed to, it, 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 was, it was being responsible. That was sort of the key to him improving. That was, that was his successful self telling him that, Tim, you need to be more responsible. You need to address these problems and uh, you can't be Mr. Popular. So that didn't come from me telling him to do that. That came from himself, from going inward and, and, and asking himself what was important and what was needed. Um, so I want you to sort of consider this exercise. It's one of my favorite exercises to go through with clients because it's, I find it incredibly effective to help clients get out of their own way. Let's move on to the, uh, challenge number two, which is how to build trust with your team. So here in Tim's case, he could tell that some of his members didn't trust him. And there was a reason for that. You know, Tim, while Tim was popular and well liked, um, uh, he certainly, he, he was aware that he felt closer to some people on the team than he did with others. He just had better relationships. He knew them longer. It was sort of a natural evolution of his time on the team. So, uh, and so with that, you know, he felt closer to some people while he felt like others were, were being distant to him and trying to avoid him. Um, so he could sense that as a manager. So what causes a lack of trust to build up? There, there are three main causes to this lack of trust in the workplace for managers. And, and, and the first is a lack of transparency or communication. So as you can imagine, employees know when you're hiding something, they know when things are going on in the company and they're not being kept informed of things. So that builds a lack of trust. Um, also, when they see unfair treatment or favoritism, that builds a lack of trust. And last but not least is dishonesty. When they know you as a manager are, are not being truthful with them, are not, are not, are not uh, you know, sort of treating them uh, with the respect uh, they, need, they, they deserve, that builds a level of, uh, that builds that lack of trust. So in this case, Tim was unfortunately favored, you know, there was favoritism going on. He was spending more time with certain people. Um, they, were get, they were getting more face time with him. And that was sort of naturally happening. So in Tim's case, he was playing favorites. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't intentional, uh, but it was just sort of a natural outcome of, of the fact that he had better relationships with these people. He just felt closer to some people than he did with others. <clears throat> so how do leaders build trust? You know, we've identified five ways leaders build trust. Number one is, and this is very, uh, you know, situation specific, but a leader who can admit they're wrong starts to build trust that way. You can't, you can't, you can't expect people to trust you if they know that there's something going on behind the scenes that you haven't owned up to. So admitting you're wrong is always the first place to start. And then of course, there's the honest communication you know, respecting the fact that people on your team are professionals and they need to know, they need to be up to date and they need to know what's really going on with the company or what's going on with you. That kind of honest communication can build trust. Being accessible, having an open door policy, help, you know, where people know that they can approach you, that starts to build trust. Um, reaching out first, you know, for you to, you know, start conversations, stop by people's desks, stop by people's offices, just, just saying hi and making yourself available is another way where you could start to build trust. 
and then following through on what you say you're going to do, being a person with integrity, being a person who follows through on, on words and promises that you've made. All five of these things lead to building trust with your team. And in, Tim, in Tim's case, I asked him to put himself in the shoes of those he felt didn't trust him. And I asked him, what did they need from you in order to trust you? Again, this is a situation where Tim was my client and Tim knows the situation much better than I do as a coach. My job here was to ask Tim the right questions so he could, he could find the answers for himself. And, 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 and Tim was able to find that answer. He knew that deep down, they needed to know that um, he cared about them, that they mattered to him, you know, because they kind of felt ostracized. They felt like he wasn't really including them in, in, in the workplace. So Tim came up with the solution. We sort of brainstormed it together, but he decided to take those members of the team to lunch. Um, and, and there he shared his intention of wanting to get to know them better. And he admitted that he felt like he was closer to other team members than he was to them. Um, you know, he shared that he had known others longer and he really wanted to invest in building relationships with these newer team members. Um, he also used it as an opportunity to have conversations um, asking for their input on what they needed to excel at their jobs or things that he could improve on in the department. And ultimately, he then came back and implemented their feedback. So Tim was able to win the trust of these newer team members, of the team members that were feeling left out, of the team members that were feeling like Tim, Tim wasn't paying attention to them, Tim didn't care about them. So by, by being more inclusive, by, by doing the kind of uh, outreach that we talked about earlier, um, by sharing sort of uh, his own mistake of, of, of uh, you know, not building relationships with these new people earlier, he was able to uh, uh, build that trust. He, you know, he admitted where he went wrong. He, he made the outreach to, to, to get everyone together. And again, he followed through on what he said he was gonna do. So exercise number two for you is, to think about in your own words, what do your people need from you in order to trust you? You know, if, if you think about the current situations in your offices and your teams, there's always a place that where you can improve, where you can build more trust. Uh, so think about those areas. And um, in this sort of self-reflection exercise, if you could choose one area to improve, which one would it be and why? Uh, would it be, you know, a need to uh, admit you're wrong, admit some mistakes and what you've learned from those mistakes? Is it the area of honest communication? Do you need to, uh, do you find you, you, you need to be more honest with your team about certain uh, happenings in the office? Um, do you need to make yourself more available and more accessible? Um, can you do more outreach? Can you go and, and invite people for coffees or lunch or just stop by someone's desk and see how they're doing? Um, and, or, or could, you, could you do more follow through? You know, are there things you said you were gonna do that haven't been done yet? Um, so think about where you can improve your own um, ability to build trust with your team using these five uh, points here. And now we'll talk about challenge number three, which is how to manage underperforming team members. Always a difficult, uh, you know, a difficult activity for, for, for new managers. So in Tim's case, he inherited some underperforming team members. He didn't really know how to address the problem. Uh, you know, quite frankly, it felt awkward and he was afraid of how it might affect the rest of the team, uh, whether he would let people go or, you know, what was the outcome of having to deal with these underperforming team members. So again, notice that this isn't just about telling Tim what he needs to do, but we always need to address the underlying behaviors that are stopping you from actually taking action. And you can see here that Tim felt uncomfortable. He felt like he wasn't equipped to have an effective conversation um, with these underperforming team members. So we addressed that first. And here, here's a, a great quote by um, Brian Ashkenis, author of Simply Effective, and in, it involves dealing with underperformers. So you have to prioritize the team achieving its goals and everyone performing at the required level. But in order to do this, you have to set your team members up for success. This means understanding each person's individual style, personality, and capabilities, and what they need to be successful. 
So this quote stood out to me because, you know, it was, it was, it was an article about how to deal with underperformers. And, 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 and what you're noticing here is that this isn't about for, sort of focusing on what's wrong, but taking the time to really understand where your people are coming from understanding their strengths better and their capabilities better so you can be better informed with helping them come up with, with a solution. So this, this was helpful for Tim and, and we crafted a strategy to help him have these conversations. Now I also want to address the danger of not addressing underperformance. You know, quite frankly, that, 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 that is the option that that's kind of the easy option, right? Is to, is to not address what's going on and, 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 and uh, you know, sort of let things be. But the, the, the problem with not addressing underperformers is that everyone else on the team knows, 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 knows that there are underperformers on the team, that people aren't pulling their weight, they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they're not behaving the right way, whatever the issue is. If they see that you as a manager don't care to address the problem, that really hurts team morale. You know, I've certainly been on teams where um, there was bad management and, 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 and because of that, everyone else felt like, well, nothing really matters here, right? Like there's no one's being held accountable. People are allow allowed to do things they're not supposed to do. Um, and the manager's playing favorites. They're not addressing these issues. It really affects team morale. So a manager who thinks that they um, can get away by not addressing underperformers um, is really kidding themselves. It also sends a message to upper management that you're not a good manager, that you, you don't take your job seriously, and that you're not qualified to really lead people. Um, and, then, and then, of course, it undermines your own performance. So if, you're, if there are underperformers on your team and your team's not hitting the goals that they're meant to hit, then, of course, you're going you're gonna to be impacted by that, before, that lack of performance as well. So there's some real uh, serious um, implications to not addressing uh, underperformers. So here are four steps to start to address underperformers. First, come at it from a place of curiosity. You wanna understand what the underlying issues are. You wanna drop any assumptions, drop any judgments you have about the person, and really just you know, be sort of a, 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 caring, um, uh, a caring manager who really wants to first reach out to understand what's going on with this person as a whole. Don't just see them as sort of a, um, a member of your team that has a, a job function, but understand what's going on with them both personally and professionally. Um, Cause those are all, you know, that, that impacts people's performance. The next thing is you want to clarify expectations and make sure they understand what, what they're expected to do. And with that, you then help them outline a roadmap to improvement. So together you define the, um, the pieces that, that, that are required in order for them to improve so that that's clear as well. And then of course, provide ongoing feedback. Um, let them know how they're doing, tell them what they're doing well, show them where they can continue, continue to improve. And those are the four elements of a good sort of um, uh, progress, uh, a performance improvement plan. Now Tim's solution here, um, you know, of course it's never that simple, right? You're dealing with people and, and Tim had to gain the trust of these team members first. He had, to, he had to really make sure that they felt comfortable being honest with him. You know, so again, I like to point out that, you know, while, while strategy is important, how to do things, uh, knowing how to do things is important. Um, when you're dealing with people, you, you've got to get into sort of the, the soft skills of understanding how to connect and build trust and build relationships first. It's not about just like charging in like a bull and telling people what to do. So Tim had to first really if, if, you, if Tim was going to be effective, he had to earn the trust of these people so they would feel comfortable opening up to him, which he did. And he learned that they were underperforming because they were afraid to ask questions. So it wasn't that they really didn't know what to do, but you know, they, here they had these questions and they felt like it wasn't a safe place for them to, 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 to look like they didn't know what they were doing. So they were afraid to ask questions, which of course will kill any team's performance, right? So people, you need to create that sort of psychological safety on a team so people know they can take risks and ask questions and ask for more clarification. So now that he was able to sort of identify these issues, together they, they discussed the kind of support that was needed for these team members to, to flourish 
And then Tim was able to help, uh, help, help these team members and help them improve their performance ultimately. So, so notice the, the steps that are needed, right? It's, again, it's not just about strategy. It, it's so much about how do you connect with the people on your team? Do they trust you? Are you providing a safe space for them? Um, and, and that's how you can then move forward with the practical applications of a performance improvement plan. So here's exercise number three. Here are five questions for you to sort of open up this conversation with an underperformer. Um, how are you feeling about your performance lately? Where do you see opportunities to improve? So in this case, you know, here you are, you're asking them for their input, their feedback. Uh, and that's a great way to start this conversation. What are the parts of the job you enjoy the most? What are the parts you don't feel excited about? You know, these questions can give you great insight into uh, their natural strengths and the pieces of the job that might not be a good fit for them, which is of course important for you as a manager to know. Um, how clear are you on your goals for this quarter? So again, this is a, a piece that sort of touches on the need for the clarity of expectations. This is a great way for you to gauge, are they clear, do they understand what they need to do? And if they don't, then you can address those problems. And then, and lastly, do you have the tools you need to do your job well? Again, this is a great way to understand, like what are the resources that might be missing that you, you may not know, that you may not have thought of? So what I like about these questions are, you know, this puts you in the, um, in the coaching seat. And, and a manager who understands the skills of being a good coach can be a much more effective manager. So, the, the, the co so this, this idea of you being a coach um, really starts like this. So coaches ask open-ended questions that invite a conversation, that invite deeper learning and deeper introspection. Um, and, and, and what's great about that is you as the manager don't have to be the answer person. You don't have to have the answer to everyone's problems. If you can just turn it back on them and ask them questions about what have they tried, what have they thought of, what are they struggling with, you can help them um, uh, you know, become solution oriented. You can start to train your team to understand how to figure out their own problems and become much more effective and productive individuals. So again, so as you're coaching your employees, I, I want you to think about asking open-ended questions. Uh, be curious about why they're struggling and don't just jump in with, with an answer that you think is right, because quite frankly, your answer might not be the best solution. Um, so help them become solution oriented, help them sort of work through, understand how to work through these problems themselves. Um, and then it really relieves the pressure off of you to have to figure everything out or assume that you know what the solution is. Um, they might have a perspective on a problem that you don't have. So it'd be helpful to understand uh, their perspective and they might have uh, with that new with their own unique perspective They might have some unique solutions that you would never have thought of anyway So again, this is an opportunity for you as a manager uh, To practice being a coach so that you can make your team members more effective And so you don't have to do all the heavy lifting as um, As you know as was one of Tim's challenges earlier where he was just not delegating but just taking a lot, a lot of responsibility for himself uh, so in summary, management is about taking care of your people. Uh, build your confidence by asking what your successful self would do. Own your mistakes and have open and honest communication in order to build trust with your team. And help underperformers by helping them understand their needs and strengths. And with that, I want to offer anyone who is uh, interested in diving, actually doing these exercises. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to, uh, to dedicate time to, to actually do the exercises on this presentation. This was all about giving you the information that you need. But I would be happy to share a, a copy of these exercises with you um, and also a, a free 20-minute consult to go over the answers to these exercises. Uh, so all you have to do is email me at mo at mgccoaching.com. Um, I encourage you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. I share a lot of content on LinkedIn uh, related to these topics. Um, and then, of course, feel free to visit my website at mgccoaching.com. And I think with that, uh, we'll open this up for some questions. Mo, I have tons of comments. First of all, I've seen you in action several times now. And so I want to make sure our listeners know, 
understand what an amazing offer it is that you've given them to, to chat with them for free for 20 minutes, uh, particularly that you've given them something very specific to talk to you about. So A, thank you. Um, B, I've been a manager uh, off and on over the course of my career, I would say over the last 15 years. And uh, I have tons of questions. So what that makes me think is what you've talked about today, certainly important for new managers. But as you said mm -hmm. at the top of, of the hour, this also applies to anybody who's been in management for a while. Sure. Um, dealing sure. with different challenges. And so I invite our listeners and we still have uh, nearly a hundred of you on, on the call, this is a great opportunity to ask those questions. So please go ahead, type them in in the Q&A feature. Uh, but the good news for me, Mo, is I guess if we don't get a ton of questions from the audience, I can just take the next 20 minutes of your time and we can have a, a public Jeff and Mo coaching session. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, to, to get us to break the ice here a little bit, the first, first question I jotted down was, and I see some questions coming in. Thank you all very much. Um, in, in exercise number one, well, with Tim's situation, do you mm -hmm. believe that somebody can be Mr. Popular and Mr. Responsible? Are those things mutually exclusive? Can somebody successfully do both of those things in your experience? I think so. Yeah. And, and look, because what you'll find is that, uh, you know, God, it's like, it, it never amazes me how complex we are as human beings, right? That's what I love about being a coach and working with people. So, to, you know, when, when we identify these different versions of ourselves, they're, they're never mutually exclusive. You know, we're, we're complicated people. And so, again, this need for wanting to be popular and wanting to be liked, it wasn't that that needed to go away. That just couldn't be sort of the, you know, that was unconsciously driving all of Tim's performance and his decision making was through that filter. So Tim had a blind spot. He didn't realize he was doing this. He was just doing what he always knew to do. And he was operating through this one filter of, I want to be popular, so I'm, I'm scared to address these issues and look like the bad guy. And so as his coach, by helping him first identify where the perspective he was coming from and seeing that that wasn't the, the, the best perspective that was going to get him the best results, I invited him to interview his successful self. And through that exercise, he realized that, um, you know, he knew deep down he needed to be, res be more responsible. He, need he knew he needed to address these issues head on. And by him coming up with that himself, um, he was able to do that uh, with more confidence. And, 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 and it wasn't like the need to be liked went away. In fact, because he was being more responsible and he was setting boundaries, he was being firm and clear with people, that actually... Um, earned him more respect with the team. So, you know, he did become, you know, the, the liking part actually happened when Tim was being a responsible manager as well. So that, that, that was sort of how it all works. It isn't this either or situation. He wasn't missing out on that. Um, but now he had, he was consciously coming from a more productive perspective. I figured you might say something along those lines. Uh, some awesome questions coming in from our from our attendees here. I'm gonna first go to, um, this might be fairly easy for you to answer, Mo. I, I have a theory as to what you're gonna say, but Hillary's question, uh, what do you suggest about having conversations with under underperforming employees in a situation where as a manager, you don't have an office, but share an mm -hmm. open office seating area with your team? Yeah. So, you know, if the question is if, if everyone else can hear or if everyone else can see you're addressing something with an underperformer, um, that, you know, one, one, that's a great question because obviously you're, you understand that this is a sensitive conversation um, and you obviously care enough to, to want to sort of create a safe environment for that person. So maybe it's an opportunity to step outside of the office, um, go for a walk, maybe invite them, invite them for a coffee. Um, you, you know, one thing to consider is that when we have these conversations with underperformers, uh, it might feel heavy. You know, it, it has a tendency to feel heavy. This is going to be an uncomfortable conversation. And, in, and, and, and so that might be sort of your natural inclination. So I invite you to come at it from a different perspective and, and come at it from a place of um, curiosity and learning. So while, the, while it might be clear that they're underperforming, you might not know why. So, you know, make, make it a safe place for you to sort of ask questions. Hey, how, how's it going? 
you know, like how, how are you enjoying work? Um, it looks like you're having some challenges, like, you know, share with me what's going on. I want to, I want to help you. So like, you know, inviting them into a safe conversation where they feel like you care, where they feel like they can open up to you. Um, you know, come at it from that kind of perspective. But to your point, yeah, if you have an open office, I think I would sort of make an effort to maybe try and find some private space area to have that conversation. Uh, another great question that came in, do you have any strategies for managing in a multi-generational workforce? Uh, this seems to be a trust issue. And the person who asked the question said they don't seem to want to be managed. I'm guessing this is probably a younger manager who's having trouble managing an older uh, team member. Uh, so whoever asked that question, feel free to clarify. But uh, do any of your thoughts for handling challenges change when you're looking at a, you know, a, a team that's made up of several different age brackets? Um, yeah, you know, and this is actually um, uh, a, a common situation managers are facing today. And you know, the, the idea here is that um, I, I, like to, I like to help managers feel like they are in control. And, 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 and one way to look at it is, um, I, I love this Bruce Lee quote, it's be like water. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when he, when he, what that means to me is be flexible, be, ad be adaptable. And so when, when managers will come to me and say, hey, I've got, you know, millennials and older people and different personalities and it's difficult, you know, it, it usually tends to be because, you know, managers want to manage their way, you know, managers want to manage sort of like based from their perspective. And so I've worked with managers in the past to sort of um, still feel like they're in control and, and, and by being in control, we invite them to be more flexible and adaptable. So you can speak to a 25 year old, uh, in, in, in one conversation and then in the next conversation you might be speaking to a 55 year old and you get to choose how adaptable and flexible you want to be. Um, and so that's what makes for an effective manager, especially in these multi-generational workforces. So for, for me, in my, in, my, in my experience, I can you know, just share anecdotally that that's the strategy I find that works well is in, in this case, you know, I, I don't, it, it's not that my client feels like they have to compromise themselves and they need to, you know, be everyone to everybody else. It's more so that they get to choose, they get to be water. You know, they get to choose how flexible and adaptable they're going to be because that makes them a better manager. So I, I, I kind of just sort of share that perspective on how I would deal with uh, a strategy for, for thinking about how to be, because uh, if the goal is how to be more an effective manager, right? The goal isn't for you to just get, to do things your way. So if the goal, if the bigger goal here is how do you be a more effective manager, um, then you need to sort of put your, put your sort of uh, self in their shoes and understand what's going to work for them. We've got a, a question here from Jess that I kind of anticipated that we would get. So Jess's question is, if you already have a crushing workload and mm -hmm. are now expected to manage a person, any tips on how to make time have an open door policy or have a healthy proactive discussion with your new employee when, you know, I'm, and I'm adding words on to Jess's question, you're already at 110% and now you've got to really go out of your way to, to sort of be a coach and an effective manager for an employee. How do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, that's, that's definitely not an ideal situation. So I can, I can empathize, but you know, one thing that I find, um, uh, just under the principle of effective relationship building. And I do actually do this with all my clients is when a new client comes on board, um, we have a conversation really based on that's uh, really around the coaching relationship. And, and what are some of my expectations? What are some of their expectations? And we kind of come together and create what's called the coaching agreement. And, and this, you know, this is a one-time conversation but the, the uh, sort of mileage I get out of this conversation is that you get to establish how, how the relationship is going to work. What are the best practices? What are the expectations? And so I think it's actually a good tool that managers can, can use with, uh, you know, with new uh, you know, people that they're managing is, is have one conversation that sets up a really strong foundation for your relationship. So, um, so, so this is an opportunity for you to talk about like how busy you are 
and how you want to help them or how you want to engage with them. And then you're also asking them, like, how do you want to engage with me? Like, how can I be helpful as your manager? What kind of support do you need from me? And it's almost like once you have this sort of introductory conversation, th then you can also understand what the expectations are. So, you know, the, I think the underlying sort of issue behind the question is this, is this idea that you've already got a lot of work to do and you're assuming managing this new person is going to be more work. And sure, it might be, but you and that person get to decide what the sort of level of engagement can be and based on what the needs are. So you want to have a proactive discussion on sort of establishing what this relationship looks like so that you don't have to sort of carry the weight of how am I going to make this work? Because um, if you're wondering, that means you haven't clarified these expectations. So I would say go ahead and clarify expectations. Uh, build a strong foundation of how you can both have a successful relationship with each other. Our remaining questions in, in looking at them, though, I think they're, uh, they're all, I think you can label them as being about managing up as opposed to managing mm. down. So before <laughs> we get to these questions, does anything that you've talked about today change when you are looking at managing up as opposed to managing down? And maybe we should define managing up first for people who aren't familiar with that term. I don't know how you would describe that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, from an example perspective, it's this idea that, you know, when you have a boss, um, great ways to manage up would be um, uh, one, one being proactive with them and, and sort of helping them. I, I think, so. I, I, you know, I, I sort of hold, hold this one rule about, dealing with leadership and management is um, the golden rule is you want to make your boss's job easier. <laughs> so if you, if you can do that, you're, you know, you're, you're keeping your boss happy. That's, that's one way of managing up. Um, and the other is um, I've seen it done is, you know, when, when managers sort of um, dump work on your plate and there's no sort of clarification of priorities or things like that, it's important for you to, uh, you know, they may not understand that you need more clarification on say priorities or deadlines or things like that. So um, rather than sit there sort of, you know, being upset with all this work and not knowing what to do with it, I would, you know, part of managing up is you communicating to them, hey, I've got, you know, these five projects that you want me to work on. Can we talk about, you know, which, which are the priorities? Um, can we set some deadlines that make sense so that I can be successful in getting these all done for you? So managing up looks like, you know, you, you communicating to them what you need um, in order to be successful. Um, so, you know, those are some examples of managing up. And that's, and sometimes doing that is, is having another difficult conversation with a, I think a very different spin on it where the power mm -hmm. dynamic has changed. So let's dive right. into some details here. So yeah. a question came in, how can I encourage a new boss to become more of a coach themselves without coming across as patronizing? Or maybe this question <laughs> is about, you know, several layers of leadership. Uh, maybe I'm yeah. reading it wrong, but you know, how, encouraging a new boss to become more of a coach. Yeah. So <laughs> I love that question. Um, so, you know, that's, that kind of question, uh, I would invite that person to um, be a coach themselves. So, uh, you know, because the, the reality is, look, it's like when, when, when the question is, how can I change the other person? That's, that's a losing battle uh, for the most part, right? So it's really all about what's within your control in this relationship. So when I think of coaching in the, in the workplace, um, one of the, you know, the, Coaching can be such an effective tool um, if you're someone who's, you know, being curious and asking good questions. Um, and so if you start doing that, you might find that the conversations you're having um, are just much more productive with this, with this type of boss. So if you're feeling like, um, but, you know, if you're, if you're feeling like you need coaching or you want coaching from a superior, um, Maybe there might be someone else in the, in the organization that could be that kind of mentor coach relationship. Um, it's, it's tough to sort of want to be coached by someone who doesn't know how to coach. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely feel for you if you kind of want that relationship and you're not getting it. Um, but maybe that's, that's part of the difficult conversation uh, um, to have in saying, um, um, here's something I've been thinking about, you know, I, I've certainly used the excuse of, Hey, I read this great book. 
you know, there's a great book I'm reading on coaching in the workplace. I think it'd be really effective in, in, in our department. Um, I, I, can I share it with, with the rest of the team or can we, can we, you know, find a time to talk through it? And hopefully this is a boss that sort of uh, appreciates team members being sort of proactive and learning and, and doing these kinds of things to improve the team. Um, that might be one way to invite that conversation. Um, but yeah, uh, w w without the specifics, uh, those are just some, some ideas I, I would have. And a reminder for all the folks who've asked questions here today that obviously Mo is making himself available to have these uh, conversations about specifics with you. And, and Alana, or Alana, I think your question might be ripe for following up with Mo directly. Uh, Mo, Alana's question is, um, what do you do when your manager and HR disagree about how to handle your employee? So Alana brought in her manager and human resources into a quote unquote, good behavior, bat, uh, good behavior, poor performance, improvement situation mm -hmm. and they disagreed HR and her manager disagreed about the way forward. So now Alana feels like she's stuck. How do, how do you handle that? Again, it's, it's managing up in a lot of ways, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, in, in order for you to be effective in implementing the performance plan, um, if you still have questions on, 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 on what the plan is, then I think, I think that invites another discussion on, on clarifying. Um, someone's going to have to say this is the way to forward, um, and and if and if that that might be you, you know maybe part of managing up is having a recommendation ready to go on what you think is the best way forward. Um, but yeah, that's that's I think that 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 requires more conversations in that situation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, another question came in. I find that I strive. Maybe this person meant thrive. I find that I strive when it comes to working with my team members, but when working with upper managers and directors above me, I lose confidence. You talked so much about confidence building early on in your presentation. How can I build that confidence when bringing my ideas and concerns to those above me? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, the, the confidence issue is um, really happens when we're super self-conscious and, um, and so, you know, when we're talking to upper management, uh, you know, we can be all in our heads about, am I saying this the right way? I don't want to look stupid. Uh, I want to impress them. Um, you know, th with the power dynamics, you know, they might be, might be scary to talk to people in upper management. So, so where I start with people is sort of getting them aware of the sort of the negative spiral of, of fear and self doubt and, and sort of, um, that self, those self-conscious thoughts that might be really impacting um, how they're showing up. And then, and then I think an effective way to sort of reframe, um, reframe that situation is put yourself in management's shoes and, 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 uh, and how would you want to show up in their eyes? So for example, you know, if, if, if how you're sort of feeling is, you know, self-conscious and really sort of nervous and not confident, um, imagine, uh, you know, you're talking to a high level manager, like what's, what's going to impress them. They're, they're going to want to talk to someone who is self-confident, you know, self-assured, um, is clear on what their ideas are. Um, and so you want to start to embody those qualities. Um, you know, that might be easier said than done, but again, that's where the coaching comes in because it's important for you to, um, be able to see your blind spots, be able to see the limiting ways you're thinking about yourself and come up with a more empowered way to move forward. Last question. Um, this may be from somebody who isn't already working in as, as a manager, but, uh, is just looking to make sure that they're going to hit the ground running. If you don't find yourself currently in a management position, how do you position yourself within an organization to be selected or promoted uh, to a management opportunity? Is it yeah, modeling yeah. all the stuff that you've talked about today? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I love that you know, you're thinking about being proactive and thinking about next steps. And so part of that is understanding what's required to be promoted. Um, you know, do they want to see that you're, um, leading different, uh, uh, leading any initiatives? Um, are, are you already exemplifying the skills of good managers where, you know, you're helping other teammates out? So you, you first kind of want to identify what are the metrics you need to hit 
and start to see if you can take on some of those roles and experiences in your current position. So one example I have is with a telecom company I've worked with in the past. Um, they have a really uh, great program. Um, and when they think about identifying uh, leaders to, to promote into, into management roles, they do that by giving people at the lower level opportunities to lead. So someone might be able to lead on a, on a specific project. Some might be able to give a presentation, you know, so they're giving people examples to step up and lead and, 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 and those that sort of step up to that uh, opportunity and, 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 and do well in those opportunities are now uh, sort of getting noticed by management as, as leadership potential. So you want to start to think about what are some of the activities that make you a leader in that organization and see if you can have some um, opportunities to do that, whether it's presenting, leading a project, um, working cross-functionally with other departments, those types of things. Mo, I just found out yesterday that I, I believe that I have moderated or hosted just over a 100 of these webinars over the years. And I have to tell you, I think this is one of the best ones we've offered. Thank you so much for doing this for us today. I also oh, wanna make sure that our, our guests know you've done other webinars for us before. One of the most viewed webinars we have is of you doing your session on how to write a networking email that people will respond to that's available in our on-demand library. People should definitely check that out. You've also done several in-person career-related events for us over the years. Uh, I can't thank you enough for today, and, and but for all that you've done for, for BU and our alumni community over the years. So thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure, Jeff. You know, I I love the BU community. I'm, I'm so happy to do this. And, uh, you know, I encourage anyone with questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm happy to chat. Again, connect with me on LinkedIn and let's keep this conversation going. And people are, are weighing in on the chat function here just to say that they agree it was really fantastic. Uh, um, our webinar series uh, takes an annual hiatus during the month of August. So you won't see a webinar from us in August, but we'll return in September with a, a whole series of webinars coming up over the next several months. Uh, in the meantime, if you're jonesing for some, some BU uh, content, I want to highly recommend to folks that you check out our uh, new relatively new podcast. We've got a podcast that's available wherever you download podcasts called Proud to Be You, uh, where we interview interesting and successful alumni who reflect on their BU experience and how it's played a role in their changing careers, the twists and turns, the lessons they've learned along the way. So uh, you can find that at bu.edu slash alumni slash podcast, or again, Proud to Be You, wherever you download podcasts. Um, and if you or any alumni you know would be interested in offering a professional development webinar, as Mo has done, Done over the years. Uh, we're looking for some new speakers, so please feel free to contact me uh, at the Alumni Relations Office or you can email me at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Uh, thank you again, Mo. Can't, can't, can't say thank you enough. Yeah, you're so welcome, Jeff. So welcome. Looking forward to the next one. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be. Take care, everyone.